Okay, we're going to get started now. We're just going to go through a little bit of housekeeping. Just bear with us tonight. We uh, have had a few technical difficulties so far. So if we do take a little bit longer to go from slide or put you into breakout rooms, we do apologize. Just the first thing, if we can have everyone please mute just for now. We will get you to unmute when you go into the breakout rooms, but just while we're going through the beginning slides, just to mute. Awesome. Cool. If you don't already, we'll give you 30 seconds. Just go grab a pen and paper. Um, we'll just get you to do a few exercises tonight. So give you 30 seconds just to go grab that now. Cool, so just when we're going into the breakout rooms that we've already mentioned, just be curious of everyone's opinions, get, give each other a chance to talk, share your ideas, etc. If you have any questions, just make sure those go into the chat box. We will stop several times throughout this seminar. So just making sure those just go into the bottom. You can do that via private, so it can go directly to Barry or myself, just at the bottom or it can go to everyone. So if you don't want to share as a group, just chuck it in there as well. Just change who it's to. Cool, so just a little bit about the workshop. So the what, I'm sure everyone has used small sided games before. Hopefully this presentation will just give a few more ideas of how you can make them more effective. The when, Cool, so this can be used with all age groups, regardless whether you work in junior football or if you work in senior space. The why, this will help with maximizing football actions and quicker decisions. And also it's a lot of fun. So the how, we'll give some examples of how to use this throughout your training sessions. Hi everyone. Uh, we're just gonna start with a little game of guess who for the first minute, so I'll give you 15 seconds to guess who these footballers are. A hint, the one on the right is a goalkeeper. Just chuck your answers just into the uh, chat box once you've figured it out. So we have one Mata Manuel Neuer. Next one. Adam should know the one on the right. Ronaldo, Harry Kane. Then the next one are coaches. So Carlo Ancelotti and Klopp. Klopp hasn't changed much, has he? So now we're going to um, show a quick video. Hopefully it uh, plays without any technical issues. If it does, we will send this out. So it's just a two minute video. So make sure your sound is up so you can watch and listen to this. All the sided games are a very important part of training in general. It's something you use often as part of our uh, week plan. The benefit to train in small spaces is because you don't keep time to the players to think. It's a lot about automatism and, and uh, find uh, the right decision without a, lo a lot of thinking. Fast decision, I think, is the, the one of the most important things. Uh, decision under pressure, um, always decide with the with the less touch, they, they, they can decide the, the moment. But football is not play one touch, play two touches, or play drive the ball or make a dribble. So football is play the right decisions in the right moment. Sometimes you have to take two touches, but sometimes one, sometimes dribbling, sometimes you have to take six touches. So every single action is completely different. It's not the key point. Is enjoy small sided games a lot. It's probably the, the, the um, preferred session, I would say, because it's, it's proper competitive, it's a small space, it's a lot of shooting, a lot of finishing. Um, it's all what they are, they're all good in that as well. 
maybe not all of them, but most of them are really good in that, and so they, they love it. And if I would ask at the beginning of the week, what do you want to do today, then um, probably a lot of players would say, um, yeah, let's play five sides of football game with all the modern defending, the spaces become smaller and smaller. I think they all enjoy it. I'm not sure if it's a 100% favorite game of Virgil van Dijk, but um, because he's pretty much as big as the pitch. There are a lot of players who always love the, 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 the smaller games because um, they're not so fast to run. Uh, but uh, it's something also like a quality uh, from some players uh, in a smaller space. They have more quality than others and sometimes have problems to transform the, the quality on the, on the bigger pitch. Playing each other in the training sessions and one team beat the other one. Sometimes they're happier to beat the opponent because they love to win his mates, you know, with that in the locker room and so that they love. That is the point. So at the end, is is this is a jungle and they have to compete between them and, uh, and they're desperate, you know, to be part of the team and that's why they have to play better than the, the other ones. But in these games, it's really important that you, as a, as a manager, as a coach, that you make good decisions in your role as a referee, because um, if not, yeah, it can become quite emotional. Cool. So just in the chat box, just down below, what were any keywords that you uh, emerged or any uh, key statements that you found really interesting from those professional coaches? Obviously, they were professional coaches, so you might be sitting there going, oh, what kind of relevance does that have? to me in our amateur leagues or in our development um, leagues, but if anything pops up, just chuck it down into that group chat box. We'll just give you 15 seconds to chuck any keywords or statements down. Yep, enjoy, fun. Competitive, definitely. I think I'd um, definitely agree with the competitive one, especially I've watched that clip a few times now. And I think regardless whether you are coaching a junior team or a professional senior team, competitiveness on any level, kids want to win, whether it's, they don't necessarily want score lines or anything like that, but they definitely want to try and score goals, win that sort of thing. So we're just gonna pop along to the next slide. So this was a study or research done at Manchester United Academy back in 2001. So they went across to the continent where they went to Spain and France. They noticed a lot of the skill level of the United players wasn't as developed as what the other countries were. So they decided to go back kind of uh, starting new and they decided to base their academy games around a 4v4 game situation rather than 8v8. So if you have a look at those stats, so the 4v4 pilot scheme, that is versus 8v8. So 135% more passes, 260% more scoring attempts, 500% more goals, 225% more 1v1 encounters and 280% more dribbling skills. So as you can see, a lot more touches on the ball, a lot more game realistic opportunities for them to develop as well. And then if we think about the small side of games, we want to have relevance to when they actually play the match itself on the weekend or during the week. So here we're just taking a little snapshot of Real Madrid versus Dortmund. And as you can see, we've just highlighted a little area, the pitch where it's a 3v3. And you have these little battles all over the pitches, whether it's 1v1, 2v2. And then we want you to start thinking about how can I take that little snapshot and then bring that into my training. So if you think about instead of going into like a large game, if we have a small side of game and, and ideally on that part of the pitch, we um, they get more repetition of that actual part of the game. And then here, if you extended that box out, it could easily become a 4v4 or a 5v4. And then on the next image you'll see this is probably more of a realistic one where you see it now a 4v2 to the defending side so i know i'm personally guilty of when i set up some practices i will give the attacking team an extra player an extra two players to try and get some success but that's not the real picture at times 
So we need to start thinking about how we can design the practice to make it um, more challenging for the players and realistic to them. So a quick story for me, a few years ago, I was coaching a team and the players, you, as, as an attacker, I got to decide how many defenders I ran up, I got to play against. And I would have assumed the player might say like up against two, so 1v2, but then the player goes 1v3 and I wouldn't have picked that as a coach. And they went and played around all the three players and scored. So from that moment on, it kind of made me start to reflect more on my uh, design of a session to help them try meet the needs of my players. So different players will need different um, needs within your uh, team. Cool. So we're just going to put you into breakout rooms. So just bear with us. So when you go into breakout, breakout rooms, you just discuss. So we'll ask you all to turn on your mics. And if you're comfortable, turn on your cameras as well when you go into these. But just in your groups, just discuss the difference in small-sided games and larger games in your own environment. So it might be when you use small-sided games, it might be at the start of the season, you might use it more, or you might use it more at the end of the season, those sorts of things. So just be with us when we just put you into these break breakout rooms. Hello. Hello. Would you like to see something from your group that you shared? Yep. Um, we thought that um it's good to have extra hands on if you are splitting younger age groups into small groups so that both groups keep on focus if you're working more with one group than the other or if you're working with one group someone can work with the other group um and also the the kids if you're playing a three or four side game they'll often say are we going to play a match later and they don't see it as a match so just um someone else in the group said if you turn it into a tournament even if it's a 3v3 small-sided game and you turn it into a tournament and they swap which three they're playing against, um, that keeps them interested in the small-sided game. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Adam. So I'm just going to give you some example of a team I work with um, and using an actual game model or a way you want actual, your team to play. So when you're doing the small-sided games, there's a bit of relevance to what you want to see them trying to do in the match itself. So on the next, this quick little video clip, hopefully it plays properly. But uh, this was the part of the playing statement we're working on. So it's defending to regain possession as quickly as possible. So before we play it, you can see that we played a 6v6. With the pitch the... is split into nine squares. I think this flat is missing, so we'll just go with the line of the box. So the way the normal game, except if the ball is played in, let's say someone's in the far uh, square in possession, if the Blues go and press, so if the Blues go in and press and win it with one, counts as one goal. If they go in and press and there's two players in that area when they win it, it counts as two. So straight away, we're not telling them they have to do that. So we're, we're um, trying to affect the players' behaviours with the um, rewards within the game. What do we need to be aware of then? Cool, so recognizing that all that screen and pressing that we've talked about. So if we can go and be aggressive in our pressing. So asking the players, not telling them directly what are some of the considerations you need to think about if you're gonna try and press aggressively and press high on the pitch. Put it in these areas, go and score. So if three come in, it's even three, but then recognizing our shape if they break that line and then it's that transition to defense. So these will delay, these will get back and try and win it. So this is the, the players playing it now. So the pitch is split into the nine. Good, that's three, keep it. So the players have won it in that area, but they have to maintain possession. You've got to keep it though, you've got to keep it. Good, seven, three. And then we're trying to give them some ownership within the practice. So each group got to decide a square on the pitch that they'd like to win it in. And then we said, we'd give you three goals for that. So each, the other team didn't know what the, each team was working on. So I went and spoke to them separately. And this group had a discussion. Here? Which side? This one. Right, win it there and it's three, okay. Ready, get set. The score is... 10-9, but then I'm going to keep the score secret from now on. 
So here you'll see they chose the middle left hand square, and then you'll see the behaviors now. So here you see one, two, three, four players as the ball is going to enter that zone, they start to press aggressively. But they didn't maintain possession, so they didn't get the points. And funny enough, then we asked at the end, which square was the other team trying to play into and the players would identify straight away. So then we tried to link that to the game. If there was a team you're playing against, you might try and exploit certain teams. And then this was the game they played that weekend. So hopefully they've always been working on a training and those behaviors. So I didn't tell them to try and press in this area, but because we're linking the trend to the game, so hopefully you'll see. But the main thing was when they won it, they regained possession, and then they retained it. So we'll speak a little bit about the terminology in a minute. And here's another example. Win and possession and then maintain them. So some of the considerations you need to think of when using these types of games or small city games. So if you have odd numbers, you um, some people call it a floater and neutral a joker. So why would you use that? What might be the negatives or positives of using that? In the game, there's never someone that plays for both teams. But in the image we showed you with uh, Madrid and Dortmund, we talked about the defending team might have extra players. So why not overload one team? And then we'll give you an example of a positive in a while um, when you might use neutral players for your to benefit of the, the session. And then thinking about reducing touches in the game, there's advantages, there's also disadvantages. So potentially it could get your team to speed up play. And um, if it's a maximum of two touches, then what, what do you think might be some of the disadvantages? Just put that quickly in the chat box if you can think of any disadvantages of you reducing touches for your players. Anything I need to add? 50 more seconds. Yeah, spot on Adam. Yeah, and then if you think about what, if they do take more than two touches, what is the consequence? Do you give a free throw or team? That doesn't happen in the game. So think about when you're using these types of um, progressions or constraints in your practice, are they linked to what you're trying to work on? Is there going to be benefits for the players? So limiting touches forces decisions rather than improving the player's decision making. And then if we have directional practice, so when you're designing your practice, if it's directional, it will help with the realism. So multi-directional can help with their awareness, but directional will give them then the four moments of the game. So attack and defend and transition to attack and transition to defend. And then when they play the actual match of the weekend, that will have the four moments. And then we have, if I know this isn't possible to everyone, you might only have a small area to practice on, but if you're lucky enough to have a facility where you can set it up in that area of the field. An example might be if you're working on defending and then you've got the box marked out on your pitch, and then that can be a reference point to the players if the ball is in the middle of the pitch or back four or back three is never wider than the width of the box. You're giving them actual reference points for their uh, benefit. And then thinking about, are they getting lots of repetition? So are they getting plenty of opportunities to practice that session? And then in the next slide, we'll link that into the New Zealand four corner model, which you can use within your planning. So here in the screen, we've got uh, on the right hand side is another practice. We will have a small clip on that. But if you haven't heard of the New Zealand four corner model, they've got the technical, tactical, physical, mental, and then that's encompassed by the social, emotional. So if you have a thing, try to tick off these boxes when you're designing your practice. So this practice here on the right, you can see the, the red team. So the outcomes for the red team was 
to play it through on the ground into the box. So this part of the pitch was one. So the two side parts of the box counted as one. If they could slide it into the middle, that counted as two, which obviously is a better scoring opportunity. But then in the design itself, when the Blues won possession, if the Blues made six consecutive passes, that's how they scored. So even though what we want the Blues to make those six passes, it links in to what we want the other team to do, which is press aggressively and high and win the ball. And then we also said if the Blues can dribble out and stop it there, which is more difficult, we'll give them two. And then we've got another, the next part of this practice. You'll see the pitch is split into five channels. When the ball is played into one channel, so the red team are still trying to score, or if they're able to switch it. So here you see the ball is in the opposite channel. The blue team's objective was to always try and defend three channels. So if the ball is here, they need to be defending the three closest channels. So if this player was still over in the corner, then that's a point to the Reds. So then if the ball moved into a central area, the Blues would be defending those three. And again, we linked it, they can make the five or six pack consecutive passes or if they dribble out. And then the next slide is linked in. So there's a lot on your screen at the minute, but this was, we put, we're lucky enough to put GPS data on the players mm -hmm. to show that the physical outcomes you can get within a practice. So this was on one of the players. You can see the distance. So they're covering 120 meters per minute. And then the work ratio was 127. So it was like, it was tough work. And that's what we were trying to achieve within this small city game. And then here you can see their work rate was really high and their heart rate. And then on the next slide, this was the player beside them. So this was a center back and the other one, other player was a right back. So you can actually go as far as being a little bit more position specific, this will be more youth and senior space. And this the, didn't cover as much distance at the center back. So in that practice, sometimes we would start and play it in behind the full back. So they had to make that recovery run. And we were given different players within the practice, different physical loading. So we'll just give you a quick example of that in the video. And then she was similar intensity. So really high work rate and heart rate max. So it might be a little bit fuzzy as a my screen, but this was the first practice we showed you. So trying to play it into these zones. So can we play it into the central area? A little hint of offside, but that's what we're trying to achieve. That's counts as two. And if they had finished, it would have been another one. And then this was the second one we showed you with the five channels. So it's linked to trying to be uh, expansive when we're in possession. So playing with width. And then this was a point to orange because the blue player on the opposite side was four channels away rather than three. So just a little example of a player model, game model, and this can be as simple as I like my team to pass the ball. So you don't have to go into as much detail or you're working junior players, but your game design and what you're trying to get them to achieve in the small side of game is linked to what they will try to do on the match day. So we showed the press and the numbers in the video, the trapping early and regrain and high. And then in the second video, we had defending three to five lanes and regain and retaining. So it's kind of, this is adults, youth to adult space, but it's clear and concise language. So really simple for them to remember. So then they start using the terminology themselves on the pitch and then they can take some ownership of their own development. So just before we go into breakout room, Glenn Whitley, can you just take your mute off? Just explain, are you saying it forces decisions not improving? What was that in relation to, sorry, Glenn? Uh, so that was about the uh, number of passes or stopping, sorry, reducing the number of touches on the on a player because that uh, Barry made a statement saying that it forces decisions, it doesn't enhance them. Yeah, it can force. So if you think about what we said, uh, Pep Guardiola, I thought, um, defined it really well where he said football is all about decision making. So it might be 
you have to take one touch, you have to take six, six, you have to dribble, you have to pass quickly. Whereas if we say you must take two touches and then that might be the wrong decision. So I'm forcing them to make that decision. So we want to get to the point where the players are able to identify and make the decisions themselves. But then again, you can have, there is some benefits, but just being really careful of why you use it. So if I'm delivering a practice and say the tempo is dropping and I'm not happy with it and I randomly throw in, now it's two touch to try and lift the tempo, but that goes against everything I was trying to achieve within the practice. So if I was working on maintaining possession, if I put a two touch rule on it, that will go against what I'm trying to achieve within that practice. Cause it might be, I might have to dribble back, play back through the keeper. So it's just been really careful of when you use these um, constraints within the practice. Cool. So we're going to get you to work in breakout rooms again, just so you're aware, please, of the next one that comes up. So group one will be attacking moment, group two, transition to defense, group three, defending moment, group four, transition to attack moment. If you can quickly, just with your phones, just take a quick photo of that, just so you know what group is what. We'll just give you a second just to take a photo. So whatever group you end up with, you'll know which one you're doing. Cool. So I think it's really important here that this is just an example. So you can use you can have simple as possible where you might say, we're trying to work on passing. So don't feel you have to use this. That's just an example to help you get thinking. Cool. So there's that question again, just that model is 5v5, so you're just looking at designing a session for those moments. So I'm just going to put you into those groups now. Awesome. Cool. So we are going to start with group number one. So Rachel, if you're happy to discuss the session, you guys, I know obviously that was very hard and it was very small uh, time frame we gave you then to kind of come up with a little bit of session around this game model but if you want to talk through just what you guys discussed or what kind of session you came up um, I'd like to hand this off to Glenn or Netra please it's cool uh, Netra hey um, so Rachel made a really good point about everyone being you know above the halfway line um, to score um, that was definitely one I did with my kids, sort of bridging that gap because the defenders seemed to stay back too much. Um, and Glenn, Glenn talked about a counter counter attacking one. Um, I didn't I didn't get it too much, so I'll leave that for him to explain. And um, but I think we were sort of on the same page about sort of having like two two strikers on each end, and then. The, the goal is to get it to the striker. As soon as you get it to the striker, transition, you, you go the other way and you just, you know, back and forth. Um, doesn't matter what direction you're going. And I guess you can also chuck like wingers in there who who just run up and down, but don't necessarily get into the, um, into the pitch. But I guess that's also, we also got to make it realistic for the wingers. They don't always just stay on the side. <clears throat> Yeah. You're looking at uh, recreating lots of opportunities for that moment you're doing within the small sided game. Um, Glenn, did you want to expand just on what Netra went to pass off to you? I believe that is, that might just Glenn. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, I kind of had the idea. I wasn't sure if we had to use the 5v5 as all playing together or we could actually break it down. So I'd, I'd probably have a goal at each end, two defenders in, in each half of the pitch, and then two outside players as wide, and then one player coming from the middle. So you get a 3v2 at one end, and then the other person from the other end would go back the other way and, and then you get a 3v2 the other. So the two defenders would defend all the time, but then you'd be trying to create movement with the three players to attack 
and making sure they're right you know the overlapping and or cutting in and making space to re recreate the width and all that sort of stuff awesome so just looking again just at recreating those game-like moments yeah great thank you glenn cool uh, we'll just move into group number two if we go with jason yeah i'm taking um, the reins on this one yeah then, <laughs> then w is our rum spokesperson Go, it's all good loving this yes. night everyone Sweet. So uh, our moment was the transition to defence. Um, our sort of uh, key parts of that one was pressing numbers, trap early, regain high, protect and prepare. So what we sort of came up with was a, a three-zone game, so attacking third, middle third, and a defending third, 5v5. Uh, and the higher you uh, win the ball up the pitch, the more points you get. Uh, and to develop that was like, okay, sweet, we might win the ball. Well, what do we do with it then? So... Uh, in terms of the protect piece, uh, protect the ball by moving it into a different zone uh, and maintaining possession, which might create uh, opportunities to, for us to give the team extra points and things like that. Um, so it goes for the same for both ways. So, you know, you, you transition to defence in, in any area of the field. So, you know, one point in the defending area. Um, hey, you still win it, move it, keep it. And then the, other, the opposition... Uh, you don't have to change defence and attack. It's just done on either winning or losing the ball. So that was our um, our session. If I had a picture, I would have shown you. Hey, so you're looking at rewarding that behaviour you want as well. So, 100%, yeah. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. If we go to group number three, Angela. Oh. I said, I, I drew a picture of our thing. Oh, I love it. Love it, Adam. Feel free to share. Yeah, I don't know, don't know if any, I don't know, that doesn't come across too well. Yeah. But, um, we were uh, looking at defending and we uh, decided we'd do the defending three lanes because we knew we didn't have a lot of time. So we thought we'd pinch a bit of what Barry was doing as well. So we've got our, we, we've gone for a setup of using the 10 players, but in a 6v4 as well. So we could have a, a goalkeeper up here and then we were having five defenders and four attackers because off we were looking at kind of the um formation we use for seven aside ninth tenth grade um and you often get an overload of defenders rather than att attackers uh the ball is always going to start down around about the halfway line ish being played in with the uh attacking circles trying to score a goal up here and we would look at rewards uh, and deficits for uh, sliding across and just defending two out of the three um, lanes in a similar way. If the defense get the ball, they either score their goal by five passes of uh, retaining the possession or they've got the three little pop-up goals to score in. And then when the play breaks down, it always starts again from this end to repeat the defending. Oh, sweet. So again, just with that ball starting at the end, it does recreate that picture of what you're trying to do in game day as well. So that's awesome. As realistic as we can with these small sided games will allow that picture to be recreated on game day. So like you saw with Barry's video earlier, where he had the session set up, it was a lot smaller. And then in those game days, the players were able to get those outcomes as well. Well done in that group. We're just going to hop across number group number four. Richard? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? Maybe. Um, we probably didn't go into any level of detail of what Adam or the others have gone into in terms of actually doing a game structure. Um, and I haven't, haven't ever gone into um, doing sort of five versus five and and working through the, the elements and breaking up the field. So um, I haven't got a plan, uh, so apologies on, on that front. Um, Roberto might have a bit more information. Uh, I guess we spoke about um, trying to um, press with two players against uh, any attacking person and then um, spreading it to the wings, but that's um, what, what we came up with in the simplest form and time that we had. And I guess I'm here to learn um, from the other people that are, are coming up with plans and, and ideas um, to get a bit more knowledge going forward. 
Yeah, no, 100%. That's what uh, these seminars are for. It's awesome. Yeah. You know, even as people are leading this, 100% still learn from you guys. You always pick up something new. So it's awesome to see the way different people coach and the way different people put together sessions as well. So thank you for sharing that. Roberto, did you have anything you no. want to say? Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah so, uh, what I've seen, uh, um, and and we have that that sort of idea of, of the pressure, and and one of the side of the pitch, we can think in uh, maybe even just breaking into squares, getting in those three lanes, pressure on one lane, and trying to move the ball to the other side so we can get into into that attacking shape, trying to get the the, the ball, well, what I call the danger zone, trying to move it away from there and start building from, from the sides. Awesome. So you've broken it down even smaller. That's brilliant. So sometimes it might be a rule that you give to the players or it might be as simple as, like you just said, Roberto, putting those squares in and letting the players decide for themselves. So on a coaching course recently where we had um, Andy Hedge from NZF and he's been around ages 20 years on New Zealand, he's worked highest level, he's brilliant, and his games go as simple back to doing, he has nine squares, so nine on one side, nine up the other, and he lets the kids choose which square they want to defend in or attack in, um, say for instance, uh, team one chose to defend in square number four, team two chose to send, defend in number five, if they won it in that square, that was two points, but it was a secret square, and the players only knew from that team. So all of a sudden you've got a whole lot of competitiveness, uh, getting players into student zones to defend that sort of thing. So that's an example of a coach who's been around for a very long time, bringing it all the way back to the simplistic little boxes, breaking it down, letting the players kind of make those decisions for themselves. Really, really good um, session design and feedback there from everyone. Uh, we're just going to, I said, I'd give you an example of using neutral players. So if you have a look at the image on your right hand side, this might be where you've got neutral players if you're working on attacking in white areas. So the team in possession, the neutral players will play with them. And then the consideration you need to think about is how long do you let, because that's a lot of work. So that's like a physical outcome. You might do 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and then you'll swap the white players. Just be aware of when you're using neutral players of how you can then manage their physical output and then you can also try and have it in behaviors so you might not put neutral players in here you could just say if your team attacks or an assist from a white area we'll give you two goals so straight away it's in their head and they're starting to think about it so other things you could add into this game so if you're thinking about if you want to play forward so if the ball let's say they're not neutral or normal now if you want to play forward so if i pass it here and you're you're trying to get them to think about playing forward. If they play back, it has to be in one touch. So straight away, they're going to try and get into position where they can turn forward. If you want to touch on transition, it might be when you intercept, intercept the ball. If you score within 10 seconds, we'll give you two. So then there'll be that transition to attack forward quickly. And another one you might use is if you pass the ball here, someone has to make a forward run ahead of it. So you're trying to get them to attack quickly going forward. And then other ones you can think about. Someone mentioned bringing in a halfway line of getting the players up. You could also say 1v1 in this half if you can beat a player and go. So there's lots of little things you can add in to try and affect the player behaviours within the practice. And then just on a summary. So we talked about trying to get an outcome for each small side of game. So just try not to just go into a game at them. Let's see if we can get an outcome for the players. Try, if you haven't got a game model or you can something as simple as let's try and maintain possession in opposition half um, the way you want your team or kids to try and play and then think about the design of the practice so we spoke about quite a few times about what conditions are we placing on it do you think they're helping or do you think they're actually hindering it and then does it look like the game of football if it looks like the game of football you're on a winner so when you stand back does it look like it? We spoke about different considerations. How might we try and uh, make it directional? We talked about the benefits of that. Um, how can we try and get the four moments of the game? 
And I think probably the most important thing someone touched on it there at the start in terms of it has to be enjoyable and fun for the players. So if it is, they'll keep coming back, continue their own development, or hopefully they fall in love with football if they're young, or they continue to love the game itself. Okay. Yeah, I just think um, it's really important, um, made me think, Richard, um, thanks for that, it just reminded me of a session that I've had er um, earlier this week. I just want to kind of reiterate, if you are just starting out on your coaching journey and you are just starting to move into these small-sided games, it may take um, a few sessions to get used to them, learning how best to adapt, that sort of thing. It's always a work in progress, so don't feel like you're putting on a bad session or anything like that if maybe some of the constraints don't work as well as you want them to it's all a learning curve um session i had not long ago a group of kids who would normally potentially dribble around cones in straight lines that sort of thing i introduced them to small sided games they'd never done that sort of thing before and very quickly it became apparent that they found it very difficult so there was a little bit of this is in the too hard basket, sad to play up, that sort of thing. But the more it was kind of simplified and the more success they got, so bringing it back to really basic goals for them, the more they enjoyed it and the more they kind of got used to it. And kind of by the last week, they'd got a lot better at it, understood what small-sided games were and enjoyed it a lot more. So it might be going back into your own clubs, players haven't done it before. So it might take a couple of weeks to get used to things as well. So just bear that in mind as well. Thanks, Kit. Really good example. Has anyone any questions? So feel free to use the chat box or click on your video. I've already finished. Can we talk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Oh, yeah. Um, just what, what's the definition of a small side of game exactly? How many players does it consist of to be small sided before you get into is more as eight v eight considered not small side? Yeah, so it's usually they usually say four v four up to six v six, but it's quite adaptable. You can go lower and you go three v three. Oh yeah. On the research at the start, they defined it as a four v four, and then they said a large game is eight v eight upwards, and then that's the statistics they took. So can we just go back to that quickly? There, United Post. Yeah. So, Glenn, I'm just going to bring that up again. So, just to clarify for everyone, so those stats up on the screen now, that is versus an 8v8. So, if you're looking at doing 8v8 each session, that's cool. But if you look to bring it down to 4v4, these are potentially the type of improvements or type of actions that are going to be repeated more. So, just right. to get the And it might be that you do the first half of your session. I know someone, Adam touched on it, can be difficult if you have two areas set up side by side with 4v4 in each area. It can be hard at times to manage. But then if you want to later on in the practice for the last 15, you move it into a bigger game and then it'll have lots of repetition within it. And then it's the behaviours you've worked on with all the session design and then they can try and implement it in a larger game itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Feel free just to unmute yourself if you want to ask any questions. Um, just a question around how often we should sort of deploy. Um, do we, um, so what sort of drills do we replace? So at the moment, I like doing a lot of just position drills, just get a square and do it. And um, yeah, just how often should you deploy it sort of? right after your warm up or do you do something and then go into it sort of later in the session or uh yeah hi Nata. yeah so it's um they're trying to get into the point where you it take depending on the age group you're working with so if you're working with junior into the youth space you would take up the first you would depend on what warm-up you use but it would take 30 to 40 percent of the practice itself um if you can get the outcomes in a small set of game, why not go straight into that rather than doing something different? Does that kind of answer your question? Sorry, Nitra. Uh, yeah, I guess in a way, yeah. And look, we're happy our details naturally begin up at the end, and this is open to anyone. 
um, we're happy to support anyone with it. If you've got some uh, parts of the practice you're struggling with, or if you've used bits and it's, you feel it isn't working, we're, we'll, we're happy to guide you with uh, help design the small city games. So feel anyone feel free to reach out to call or email address. We'll be up, up in a minute. Sweet. And I think as Kate alluded to, it's all about practice and trying it out. You might try it out the first few times and it won't work. Um, and that's how we all learn, making lots of mistakes and trying to develop it more. So can I just ask another question? Yeah. Um, so a small sided game has to have goals, does it? You have to have the goals in there. So if it becomes a position game if there's no no direction or something. What, what makes it a um, small sided game again? So the small sided games, um, just going back to that United group, um, there's a really good study. There is a link to the video that will be sent out as well. They actually sometimes use ball goal game. They use inline goal game, just to give a few examples. So you don't always yeah. have goals at the end. It might be, say, if you're looking at movement beyond a player, it might be the player needs to go over the end zone. Someone needs to stop it in there, but can't be standing there to start with. So it right. can't it doesn't always have to end in a goal. Okay. It's more linked to the area size, the amount of players in the practice, and then linked to improve the decision making. Mm -hmm. We have 30 more seconds if you want one more question. Yeah, Glenn, thanks for that. Yeah, we've got a document that we're happy to share. And it's got 50 small sided games will give you some ideas of practices you can use and tweak and tailor to match your own team you're working with. I'll email that out when we'll e also email out a recording of this webinar. Um, I know someone mentioned about slowing down to take notes, but we have to try and squeeze it in an hour and extra. So we will send out the recording and the small sided games. So there's our details. That's uh, Kate alluded to the link to that YouTube. Um, it's on the United Study. So it's, I think it's a 35, 45 minute webinar. They spoke to the lead researcher um, being interviewed, discussing it. And that's what we took the screenshot of it. So it's a really interesting watch. It kind of changed the development process within England um, and the FA. And you also have our emails. I think for me, it's a massive... Uh, massive thank you for taking time out in your Friday evening. It's been really enjoyable for us. Um, as always, feedback is welcome. If we didn't get the right answer in your questions, please email us. Our details are on the screen. I think that's about it. So feel free to log off. Again, a huge thank you from Barry and I for taking out time from your Friday night. I know it's not always a great night to do a webinar on, but thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone.